Okay, thanks a lot for coming to this lecture so early. I guess it has been a busy week for you. Um, we heard a number of things on clouds, more from a now casting perspective, in particular just, uh, yesterday from John Messikalski. And motivated by that, we choose to actually start the satellite part with a, a look at passive satellite images. And I hope by now you know why for now casting applications you use stationary satellite data, the main source of data to look at. However, also in the review of the summer school, we got back the, a bit of feedback which said we should also look at other more sophisticated sensors and more sophisticated sensors in a sense of active sensors like what we visited on um, Wednesday from ground, but you also have these sort of sensors from space. And in addition, I thought the current perspective, so it's clouds and precipitation, there, there are other interesting things we're interested in clouds and precipitation from a climate perspective that I should mention something about aerosols, which is quite relevant to our institute. And in principle, I think I should have also uh, put in radiation. As you saw in my research interests, I'm quite interested in radiation and radiation budget and the influence clouds have on that. So that's how this title, uh, title ca came about. To give a bit more concrete idea what I'll be talking about. So, um, I decided to start off with the active sensors. So what is able or what is possible from space at this stage, but also of a bit of a perspective on upcoming missions, which is in this case Earth care. The same actually with precipitation. And talking about precipitation, I probably could have gone into some techniques which use passive satellite imager retrievals to estimate, uh, um, estimate precipitation. There's actually a post by Matthew Young about that using these sort of techniques. However, you have to realize these are indirect techniques. You don't see the actual pre uh, precipitation in your signal, but it's more if a cloud is at that height, it will on average rain that much. So you're relying on statistical um, relations. And if you really want to see precipitation, you need to look at uh, radar data or microwave data, passive microwave data. So I'll add something on passive aerosol remote sensing and actually why this is of interest also for clouds because aerosols have um, influence on the um, optical properties of clouds through indirect effects and I'll explain a bit uh, what this is and how we can use these sort of data to look at that. And then actually Akos will continue with looking at the Earth radiation budget and a few more specialized uh, types of um, observation techniques. So, active sensors. Um, I wasn't quite sure how much I should put in. I guess Ulrich Lewinert has told quite a fair bit at this stage on Wednesday. You also saw these instruments in um, Jülich. Principle and active sensor um, use electromagnetic waves to probe the atmosphere and um, I hope by now you know this DRA acronym at the end of LIDAR and RADAR, it's for detection and ranging. So in the end, you're just looking at the time signal of a, you emit a signal, a pulse of electromagnetic radiation, and you look at the time delay and the strength of the um, uh, received signal tells you something where this um, signal is originating from. And by looking at the backscattered intensity, um, you can infer something about um, the atmosphere, uh, so what's in the atmosphere, whether it be clouds or precipitation. The additional things to look at, one thing is polarization. What I didn't put in is also, for example, Doppler spectra. Um, so um, to um, obtain additional so, uh, so constraints on what your atmosphere looks like. You can do this in different wavelength regions, the classical uh, uh, acronyms are LIDAR for the visible. So I'm not sure if you're aware of the um, wavelength the celometer in Jülich has. So anyone has an idea what wavelength it is? So it's at 900, so in the um, near infrared. So and here I'm, I've already put in um, Calypso, so the, um, the current spaceborne um, LIDAR. 
and it uses a dual wavelength, so 500 and 1000 nanometer approximately. And <coughs> so with radar, not sure. So who knows the wavelength of the, uh, or the frequency of the cloud radar in Jülich? So it's actually a lower, it's 35 gigahertz. So CloudSat is 94 gigahertz, and that seems to be the way to go. But um, so please note that you don't have to choose this frequency. So a lot of um, ground-based um, radars use 35 uh, gigahertz, at least I think here in Germany. And this has some implications what your signal will um, look like. I'll get back to that. So and the. And uh, so the main drawback, if you're looking at these data, they're very high quality. You actually don't get a single pixel with maybe some spectral information, but you really get, uh, get a vertical profile. However, um, there's not terribly m much coverage. So you're looking at the ground tracks. These instruments look at the, na uh, at, uh, at the nadir from the satellite, and you cover swath widths in the order of one kilometer. So um, depending on whether it's the LiDAR radar, this will vary, but you're scanning a very narrow swath across the Earth, and there's another implication of that. With satellites, you have to fly at an inclination. You will see spots on the Earth very seldom, simply because you're not scanning a lot of area, but there are some regions which you'll never see, and this is, for example, the pole. So because uh, if you fly the satellite at, at an inclined orbit, you can never make it across the pole, so you're limited to I think it's uh, up to 83 degrees so you're, because the satellite inclination is 7 degrees or no, um, 83 degrees actually. So, Active sensors, so what do we have from space? And I decided to actually include another mission which was the LIGHT mission in 1994. This was um, LIDAR. Um, LIDAR in space technology experiment, and this was an instrument flown on the space shuttle. I'm not quite sure uh, if I remember this correctly, but I, I think this instrument actually failed before they had to take it down, uh, so back to ground. But it was very interesting data. I actually worked with this in a summer school myself in, I think, 2000, and I was very much fascinated by these vertically resolved plots and people at that time. So it just covered a couple of orbits, but it was the first time people saw this type of data. And this was more or less the starting point to develop the cloud, uh, CloudSat Calypso missions, which did this now in a lot longer <coughs> time frame. So it launched in 2006 and they're still going, even though the instruments now have come into some problems. But um, if you uh, look at the whole mission concept, it's not only about CloudSat Calypso, but there's a whole train of instruments, so, and it's called the afternoon train because it's flying in an afternoon orbit at 1.30 p.m. equator crossing time in a sun-synchronous orbit. And you have Aqua with a standard Modis and Ceres instruments on there. You have other spectral uh, <coughs> instruments looking at trace gases. So you have a set of whole range, a range of set of measurements to, ra uh, to, combine, uh, to look actually at the perspectives offered by different satellite sensors. So and that's the, the very unique thing. And for us, also looking at the first longer term data, this is very interesting. And it helps you interpret, for example, the shortcomings in the passive satellite instruments. So I'll get back to that also as I continue in my talk. So, um, oh, I forgot. Last but not least, um, these instruments actually initially had a lifetime of three years. So lifetime meant 99% of survival chance. But um, so they're still going after being in air space quite long. So but somehow um, CloudSat is, uh, has some problems with electricity. So we won't have these data probably for much longer. And then the question comes up, will we have another instrument like that? And here, at least from the American side, I'm not aware of any uh, developments, but um, the EU together with Japan is developing the EarthCare instrument, which will offer some increased capabilities. And here I wrote due in 
2016. The funny part being actually it was 2013 on the slide when I put it in the talk. So this was the initial estimate, so this is quite typical. So it should have been launched originally this year and was delayed a fair bit now. So and I hope this date will actually stay. So this is actually a plot from a CloudSat presentation I pulled from uh, uh, Anthony Illingworth um, simply to illustrate it. And you'll notice it's actually not from um, the actual um, satellite perspective, but from the ground. But it still shows you a bit that these data can look quite different. So, and I hope actually um, you already know this with radar you're seeing a reflectivity which is proportional to the sixth power of the droplet diameter, whatever that diameter or size, for example, for ice crystals means for precipitation. With LiDAR, you actually have a signal, so you're looking at the backscatter, and this is proportional to the, um, well, the size to the power of two. So um, you're looking at very different signals. So what you notice here, it should be turned upside down if I uh, had taken some time to actually pull this out of quick looks that, that would have easily be possible. It would have looked a bit different. But uh, what you'll notice with the LiDAR is you get a, uh, the signal is extinct once it comes from the instrument and hits a cloud very quickly. Um, and here with the radar you see you're also looking at drizzle. So, um, it's, uh, so large particles contribute most. So you see quite different um, profiles. <coughs> So in particular with LiDAR, you don't penetrate deeply into the clouds. Um, oh, yes. And on the other hand, there's some features like here, the aerosols, which are very small particles, which you don't see and uh, will never see in the radar. So, um, and in principle, the ri uh, li radar LiDAR ratio provides information about the size of particles. However, um, for this, you need actually a signal in both instruments. A former colleague of mine, Dave Donovan, spent quite some time to doing this joint radar LiDAR inversions theoretically. And then when looking actually at these sort of data, he was quite disappointed that, for example, in these regions, you simply don't have one of the instruments. So quite often, it's even hard enough getting the data to sort of match in a consistent way. And only then you can worry about doing this sort of inversion techniques. So to show some real data from CloudSat now, so what you get initially is the reflectivity. So, and this looks like this. So this is uh, attenuated signal in dBZ. So you here as x axis the latitude. So, and the first step you do need is actually quite sim uh, similar to what we saw yesterday for the passive satellite images. <coughs> you need to decide where is a cloud where do you want actually to analyze the data, assuming that it is a cloud? So um, in principle, you'd also want to look at the, um, so what temperature is it? So is it an ice or water cloud? But start with a, a classification of your signal. And here it's shown the, um, basically the cloud mask, including a confidence that it is cloudy. So this is increasingly confident and this red regions are certainly clouds. So, and once, you have this cloud mask, you can start looking actually at what your um, cloud might look like. Here is given the ice water content and the liquid water content. And to actually arrive at this, so due to this relation to the um, effective radius of the scatterers, you need to make additional assumptions. So you basically need to assume uh, effective size of the um, cloud you're looking at. So, and to do this, Actually, um, CloudSat uses a number of assumptions. One thing is actually with the ice water content, they rely actually on model temperature profiles here with the liquid water content. <coughs> you also have to make some uh, assumptions. And for this, they actually use the MODIS instruments, so passive instrument retrievals during daylight hours when they are available to arrive at a better estimate of the liquid water content. Because if you um, listen to Martin's talk yesterday, in principle, the passive instruments can constrain the column value. So they adjust this to match more or less the MODIS data. So, and it's one of the things if you wo work with CloudSat, be aware that the liquid water content profiles will probably be more accurate during daytime because they have this, instrument, uh, this additional information from passive instruments in there. 
So um, here, more or less the same thing from the Calypso perspective. So um, this is the um, attenuated backscattered one of the wavelengths. So and um, I didn't show the other measurements. So re uh, remember, there's also the uh, one micro uh, micron um, backscatter you could be looking at, which shows some dif dif differences. But um, actually, with Calypso, you also have the polarization and um, <coughs> information. So by looking at, so uh, you're emitting a polarized beam. So you're looking at the uh, return in the um, the other polarization dire direction as well. And you can use all this to actually classify what you're looking at. So and it's a bit more complicated than the previous uh, cloud mask. But we, what you're left, and I'm not quite sure you can actually see it, but here there are different classes in there, one, two, three, four, uh, color coded. And this depends on clear air. You can guess it's this blue one. So you have cloud, which is up here. So and you have aerosol, which is this class three, this orange bit in here. And um, basically use this information, first of all, to classify um, so what you're actually looking at. And uh, this is quite relevant. So uh, because you're looking here at backscatter, um, you then in a second step uh, want to convert it to something, um, the radiation people, to extinction. Um, and the ratio of backscatter to extinction is very strongly particle dependent. So it will, even for aerosols, depend very much on the type of aerosols. It will depend whether it's an ice or water cloud. So, and this is basically the first step in the classification. If you're interested, for example, in aerosols, um, Calypso, uh, the Calypso processing goes a step further. So they try to separate this in different aerosol classes. And here we have one is a clean maritime aerosol, two is dust. And basically what you do is you look at how, for example, the backscatter to extinction ratio behaves, how the polarization behaves for different aerosols. And you try to find the best fitting model in your data uh, <coughs> to actually interpret it. So um, as I already mentioned, so when I for first saw this data, even being more into the passive satellite retrievals, I was quite intrigued and they offered really a lot of insights and um, where passive satellite retrievals do have shortcomings. And I'm just going to present actually one example here from colleagues or former colleagues, I should say, at the CM stuff, this time not Offenbach, but from SMHI. Um, and they're very interested in getting the data sets right for the uh, Arctic region. Um, and their passive instruments are um, very limited simply because a number of the typical assumptions are um, difficult um, to meet. And one is that clouds are brighter than the surface, but you have snow covered surfaces. So uh, the surface is bright as well. The second thing is quite often you have strong temperature inversions and very little thermal gradient across the atmosphere. So um, you know all about it now. You did it yesterday yourself. These techniques for finding a matching cloud is actually quite difficult. And um, this is sort of actually what I also um, mentioned briefly in yesterday's uh, exercise about um, matching so to the wrong height levels. And this is very um, nice, interesting example I took from their paper um, where you see here in red and green, clouds are Calypso backscatter. And you see here in blue, the cloud height from passive retrievals. <coughs> so, and what you actually see is you don't match the cloud height. So, and they looked a bit deeper into this and found, so in the matching region, this is the sort of temperature profile. And you see the cloud really lying in this inversion. Um, here with profile B, you see there's no way you can actually match the um, observed temperature in this inversion. And um, you take these profiles actually for model. And the problem is the model simply doesn't produce a strong enough inversion in there. And if you do the searching, where do we match the observed temperature, this will fail. And this is the sort of information we can use to improve the passive um, retrievals. Or in this case, actually, we would have to improve the model to get this inversion correct. A second thing uh, from a radiation perspective I'd like to briefly mention, we now have vertically resolved clouds. And um, 
also aerosol information. And this is one of the standard products from CloudSat Calypso. Um, at this stage, it's the 2B flux heating rate product, which only use CloudSat, but there's by now uh, also one which uses Calypso to actually constrain the aerosols. And you can run this in more or less a standard radiative transfer model as operated, for example, in a GCM or in a uh, NWP model and get these vertically resolved profiles of heating rate. And they're what's actually driving the atmospheric dynamics. And you'd have a hard time getting anything like this from a passive satellite instrument. You'll never see these sort of fine details. So that's definitely one additional um, degree. So the vertical distribution of clouds, but also their radiated effects, which is very unique to um, these active instruments. So as I said, clouds at Calypso are getting quite old. So what is there in the future? And this is this EarthCare mission. Just briefly, what will change? And um, we're actually going uh, to a single wavelength, high spectral resolution LiDAR with this uh, new. Um, and um, the good thing is you're no longer only seeing the backscatter, but you're also measuring the extinction. And I'd like to briefly mention how that works. You're using, as the, this implies already, the uh, spectral information. And as probably most people know, LiDAR has, uh, or lasers have a very narrow bandwidth. If you look at the scatter, this is more or less due to Doppler broadening. If you have the gases which uh, do um, give signals through Rayleigh scattering, this is quite a broad contribution. So, however, cloud particles have smaller velocities and therefore have a much narrower peak. And so you can separate them. And with a, a Rayleigh signal, you know pretty much the density of your atmosphere. So you can estimate that and then look at actually what extinction your um, particulate scatterers, so cloud scatterers, do actually cause. We have again a 94 gigahertz uh, Doppler radar on uh, EarthCare. However, um, it has Doppler capabilities. And this means uh, you can look at things like ice fall speed, so if ice drizzle rate, convective motion, these sort of things which are quite interesting from, uh, from a dynamical perspective. Um, then you have an onboard radiometer, so in this stage, which is really collocated in contrast to Cirrus, which is flown a few, I don't know how many seconds after that, so you get really a perfect match of the data. Um, and all in all, they as engineers do always when they go to the future, they try to pull up um, things like signal to noise ratio. So we hope that the data overall will actually improve a bit over clouds, uh, what CloudSat and Calypso can offer. So now on to precipitation. Um, so actually this is in some ways quite interesting uh, as a radar because it's a scanning radar. So and um, I'll, I actually have it on a further slide, but this is realized by actually using a phased array antenna. So you have lots of different small antenna elements and you um, control them with a fixed phase. And so you can scan the beam across. So what I said about active instruments just offering a very narrow swath, swath width doesn't hold. Um, it flies at quite a low orbit, so uh, probably um, 400 kilometers standard Sun synchronous satellites are more or less in the 800 kilometer range. And um, I'll tell a bit more about the orbit. It has a microwave radiometer. Microwaves have been used very long to actually um, provide estimates of cloud water, rain water. So, and this is more or less uh, if you have worked with FMHI data, that instrument plus one additional channel at 10.7 <coughs> gigahertz which is um, more or less meant to, so, to um, improve the signal in, uh, so in heavy rain conditions. So, and you're looking at for the microwave radiometer something like 10 by 10 kilometer fields and for the radar five kilometer footprints with 250 meter resolution. So um, this satellite was launched in 1997. So it's also actually quite an old instrument. People spend a lot of thought actually on how to keep this measuring. Um, so, but uh, one interesting thing is, is it has a very flat inclination of 35 degrees. That's where this tropical TR comes from. It's the Tropical Rainfall Measurement Mission. And it was meant to really look at the tropics because there, I guess you all know that uh, the high, uh, precipitation is strongest to study the uh, precipitation in the tropical regions. So, um, and 
The unique aspect of this instrument, as I said, there had been passive microwaves before, is this radar. And you can really see very interesting details in the 3D structure of storms like this. <coughs> so um, as I said here, the 10.7 gigahertz channel do offer, does offer improved sensitivity in cases of high, ra high rain rate, which is relevant for the tropics. And you can do now all different things to combine the data from the radar and the um, and the microwave. One thing I didn't say, which I probably should have said here, um, the radar has a narrower swath width than the microwave. So um, you definitely want to have microwave only algorithms to utilize the full swath width. But if you have the radar, you definitely also want to include this to get uh, information about the vertical distribution of hydrometeors. So also there, there's an update coming. and. Um, it's supposed to be launched in early 2014. I didn't find a concrete uh, launch date. It's an international mission. And it's also flying again in a very low orbit. This time, however, at a larger inclination. So you can go, uh, go a bit further north. And the unique thing of this instrument will actually be that it has a dual frequency radar. And that's actually also why I mentioned the 35 gigahertz in, at Joyce. So, um, because this is actually what we call a cloud radar, but they use it for precipitation. And um, so this is actually not too far off the X-band radar we looked uh, or we walked on top. So this is more a classical rain rate radar uh, frequency. And this combination, so due to this power of six relationship with the disk scatterers, does offer quite a bit of improvements to estimate uh, what you're looking at. And I've here taken just scatter plots from a paper by Greco et al. from 2011. And if you have a single frequency radar and you try to retrieve the liquid water content, more or less, of your rain or the diameter of your scatterers, you're left with this point cloud if you look at the true and the uh, retrieved values. However, if you add in the second frequency, these suddenly start to align really nicely. And this is um, just to illustrate what this will actually offer in addition. Note, however, here still, for example, with ice crystals, you're still sensitive to the particle habit you assume. So if you have snow. <coughs> so, so much for the precipitation. So now I'd like to mention a few things on aerosol remote sensing. Also, again, from a passive perspective, I've touched upon the active perspective with clouds at Calypso. Um, and actually, there will be a bit more for, uh, coming from Akosh, I guess. So, um, but I'd like to start with a few basics. Most aerosol particles are relatively small compared to the wavelength. And this has some implications for the signals we are looking at. The scattering efficiency decreases with wavelength. And I guess if you know about the blue color of the sky, you know why this is. So we're in the Rayleigh regime, and the smaller the particle gets, the less efficient it scatters. And you can use actually this effect to get size information through, and this is formalized through the angstrom exponent. Overall, we are looking at very small or relatively small radiative e effects, so you need accurately calibrated sensors, which is starting to become actually a problem for things even like Metasat second generation. So um, you generally uh, want something like MODIS because it offers more channels and it's also more accurately calibrated. Generally, these algorithms work best over ocean because you know what the surface looks like. Over land, you have much more variability. And last but not least, if you're trying to analyze this in a quantitative way, you need to know actually what the uh, aerosol is. In contrast to clouds, you have water droplets or maybe ice. And even with ice, it starts getting complicated. But with aer aerosols, you don't even know the chemical uh, uh, composition, and you need to assume something. To illustrate this a bit more, briefly to remind you, probably uh, you should know this. This is the uh, extinction cross-section. Uh, and to get this from more fundamental particle optical uh, properties, you have this large Q QS, which is the scattering efficiency times the geometric cross-sectional area weighted by the number of particles in a certain radius range. And if you integrate it, you get this. But um, what's shown here, and please note this is on a logarithmic axis going for pa particles from 0.1 to 10 micrometers. <coughs> and here also a logar uh, logarithmic axis chosen. So the geometric 
So looking at the individual terms, the geometric cross-section increases here linearly because it's a log-log plot, but it's basically this power of two relationship. From E theory, we get these curves, and sorry this blue isn't blue in here, it should be, but it got lost in one of the, um, well, PowerPoint tr transitions, unfortunately. But you see this for different regions going more or less from the very um, short blue range to the near infrared. And uh, what you see is here, this is this mirror regime where you have oscillations and then it goes basically against the factor of two. So for the, ge uh, so where it's more or less geometric optics. This is actually the reason yesterday that clouds don't show much behavior. Because this is a factor of two, you can take it out and there's not really terribly much sensitivity. But this is not the case for aerosols. This is the case for clouds. Um, what you also need to factor in is this droplet size distribution, uh, which for aerosols you have very small particles. And if you combine this, what you see for shorter wavelengths, you get a stronger signal than for longer wavelengths. And um, this will actually depend on the size of your uh, particles. So from the more theoretical approach to a bit more practical observations, so this is after an article from Dubovic et al. looking at aeronet inversions, what aerosols in the real life look like. And please be aware this is not real aerosol measurements, but this is also inferred from, spectra, uh, so from radiometric information. So different regions here, urban industrial aerosol, biomass burning, desert dust. I don't expect you to see all of this, but I'll guide you through here anyway. So the single scattering albedo, so how strongly does the aerosol absorb? So, um, and uh, this basically here decreases towards the short wavelengths. If you think about an aerosol reflecting radiation back to your sensor, if you make it more and more absorbing at one stage, you will again see more or less the clear sky radiance, so you need this for your retrievals. So what I'd also like to point out is here the angstrom exponent, which is defined more or less at the, as the optical depth at different wavelengths. And what you see here, typical values of about 1.9. So what I'd like to point out is these two values here, which are very close to zero, which correspond to desert dust where you have larger particles. This is sort of the particle shape bimodal distributions. They fit to, uh, to these observations. So you can use this, and this is actually based on CWIFS data um, to interpret the signal you're seeing at a satellite. And one, what you can pull out is, for example, here, this distributions of optical depth. So you see here in the Asian region pollution. You see all other sorts of interesting things, so between January and um, July, so Mediterranean has more, uh, more aerosol loading in summer. And you can also get this angstrom exponent here, um, which tells you more or less a bit about the particle size. And this is averaged from six years of C with data, data globally. This is the sort of perspective you're trying to get into. So now I'd like to make a brief excursion. So, and this is actually a courtesy of Daniel Rosenfeld to illustrate the points I've made about how the particle size comes into this. Um, just, and this is a bit of PowerPoint, uh, well, movie animations, but I think it's quite interesting anyway. What you have is here, I guess most people will recognize this Italy, Greece. You have forest fires over Italy with the hot spots, and in the RGB composite you see this smoke clouds. So, um, and here you're mixing together three channels. It's hard to understand. So what I'd like to do is first look at the 3.9 channel. There you very clearly see the forest fires. So as hot spots in here, but you don't see anything in the cloud. And then starting from the 0.6 to going towards the uh, longer wavelengths. It's a bit hard to see actually on the screen, but here you see clouds. And if you cycle through this, suddenly the smoke completely disappears. So, and it's just the size effect. To put this in a different perspective, I'd like to compare this to um, here uh, a dust event here observed by MODIS in a true color, and you can see sort of dust being blown off from, the, um, from um, more or less Africa into the Mediterranean. You see clouds immersed in dust here. So, and um, if you, st I'm not sure why this is going wrong. So, sorry. Um, so, and here you see this a bit more as an animation, what happens. So you see the cyclone turning and this dust blowing out onto the sea. 
Now going to MODIS, starting at 0.4 micrometers. Why is it? There should be another. This is strange. Somehow it's jumping in the wrong direction. So, but um, looking at the here different wavelength channels, you see hardly any change in the uh, dust. And it's just this fact we don't have a strong uh, wavelength dependency. And um, this is due to dust particles being quite large. So, not sure why I got this wrong somehow. Um, please note also here the 2.1 micrometer channel is an absorbing channel, and you see ice clouds very darkly, and we briefly touched upon this yesterday. Anyway, as dust also doesn't have this strong wavelength dependency, it's the only aerosol which is also rele uh, really relevant in the long wave, has significant impact. And this is actually used, and I'd like to only briefly mention this anyway, um, in the dust RGB composite, where you rely on uh, differences in emissions in the thermal channels. And you're looking at these differences, which we've used before uh, also um, to identify thin cirrus. And more or less qualitatively, what you get is this pink tone, which shows um, what the dust is. And this is more or less based on MODIS. So, and uh, here you can also see these storms as they move across um, also into the Mediterranean, the very same event which I uh, showed in the visible. And this is heavily used for monitoring dust storms and warning people actually uh, where this goes and for stud uh, studying transport at our institute. <coughs> so overall, why are we even interested in aerosols and probably also clouds? They're, uh, from a climate perspective, they're a very important part of the uh, climate system simply because they uh, affect radiation. And if you can tell something about the radiative properties, as I present either from clouds or, uh, of, sorry, from Calypso, you can probably do something about the direct radiative effects from aerosols. But there's also a second effect which uh, alters the optical properties of clouds, and uh, this is called aerosol indirect effects. And they're uh, potentially very relevant uh, to climate change. And the IPCC report n uh, named them as one, pretty much the largest uncertainty in constraining what has happened in the past, but also what will happen in the future if we change the pollution of the atmosphere. And um, I've pulled this uh, graph from there to illustrate this. You have more or less an unperturbed cloud with a certain size of the droplets. And if you put in aerosols, they will affect how cloud droplets form in case of humidity. And the first effect is the, uh, basically that you get more particles. So cloud water is distributed over smaller, uh, so on, on the more but smaller droplets. And this will change their radiative behavior. There are other things. So you can then speculate how will this affect rain? How will the height of the cloud change? And you'll also get sort of feedbacks um, like um, heating through aerosol can affect the dynamics. So all sort of these effects, I'd more or less like to say concentrate of, of the, on this with a bit of an excursion to this. Um, so, and I'd actually like to start with results from, a, well, someone from Uni Leipzig, Johannes Quas, um, as a motivation. What he did is he looked at representation of aerosol in climate models and compared it to observational data. And what's shown here on the left is the cloud droplet number concentration, more or less as a measure of this um, cloud response. And he uh, compared that here to the fine mode aerosol optical depth. Fine mode, you're looking at the small particles simply because they are relevant in cloud formation. Um, and he tried to find these sort of patterns and compared them to representation of these aerosol effects in climate models. And uh, what I actually would like to concentrate on here is um, more or less this cloud droplet number concentration as a measure and um, how to get that actually from satellite. So, and I've actually asked Daniel Merck, who's sitting in here, uh, uh, whether I could use his slide because it nicely sums this up. Um, you need to make some assumptions. As you Hopefully, remember, we know something about the droplet size, probably somewhere at the basis of the cloud. You know something about the liquid water path and the optical thickness. But you need now to relate it to the droplet size. And purely from looking at the dimensions, this will be related to the height of the cloud. 
So and one of the standard assumptions, which is also sort of confirmed by aircraft measurements, is that this number of cloud droplets is constant with height and that you get a linear increase in liquid water content. So um, and actually there's um, this linear increase in an optimum case would be given by the um, condensation of an air particle as it rises adiabatic. So this is called the adiabatic cloud model. And you can then think about mixing of dry air into this. So this might reduce this slope. And if you now start, we have the liquid water content, we have the droplet number concentration, you ha already have constrained the effective radius, which will, if you do the math, change something like with a power of uh, one over three with the cloud height. And you can start integrating this over the profiles. And this is actually where this factor five over nine came in yesterday uh, versus the two over three, I think. Uh, and this is simply due to this linear increase, this assumption about the shape of the droplet. And basically uh, there you can start counting all these droplets and, um, and constrain this. Um, however, the big thing in there, which is not mentioned and which is mentioned in here as this increased cloud height effect, it all depends on the height of the cloud as well. So um, if you get more aerosols and for a given liquid water path, the cloud depth, so the geometric extent of the cloud doesn't change, you can really easily pull out the cloud droplet number concentration. And it's the under, so more or less the um, assumptions which go in these sort of analysis. However, also the cloud height might change and this might actually modulate this uh, response. These effects are quite hard to quantify. So um, that's more or less summing up what I explained now. So you need to make an assumption of the cloud and it's still sort of questionable how well this is, is um, well, warranted to apply these sort of models or how to do it better uh, uh, to do these sort of analysis. Nevertheless, they were very worthwhile because this is important information we need to constrain um, finally um, the indirect effects of aerosols if we want to understand this to um, quantify future climate change. So, and with this, I'd like to come to my um, final slide, briefly summing, uh, summing up what I uh, told here. We have now active sensors since 2006 in space. I do think they offer a great perspective. So also for process understanding, maybe not so much for now casting, but if you're just interested in processes, you can cherry pick your situation you want to look at. So you can look at overshooting tops. We saw this yesterday in the talk. And um, this is really a very new perspective, which uh, I guess will become more important. So a uh, radar passive microwave now allows us to study precipitation from space and as always instrumental in, uh, capabilities will increase over time. So aerosol retrievals generally are based on solar wavelengths simply because of this wavelength dependency. You don't have any signal in the, or weak signal in the IR and nothing in the radar range. And you generally have to deal with large uncertainties and finally Combining cloud and aerosol retrievals allows you to do these studies on the aerosol indirect effects and in the end allow you to constrain climate sensitivity. Okay, and that's it from, from my side. Thanks for your attention.